My world generation just won't do. I created the current world generation with one main purpose in mind: to stress test my optimization with extreme terrain features. It doesn't feel immersive. It's difficult to find places to build on. It doesn't resemble what I want from the overworld. This world was always going to be deprecated, so having it available means that worlds that are created in pre-alpha will be ruined when the generator is eventually overhauled or removed. Therefore, we need to replace it with something else that's more simple and future-proof. Enter the moon. We start with a flat world. The moon is well known for its craters, so we should focus on this first. We need chunks to determine craters deterministically without having to consider craters as structures. To do this, we consider the maximum size of the crater and use it to make a grid of craters scaled to that. We then floor the x-z coordinates of the chunk relative to the crater grid. Each crater grid generates 10 craters. When a new crater is generated, it is done with a random yet decreasing size from the last one. Each crater uses the randomly generated position and radius to influence a height map for the chunk. The closer the chunk position is to the crater center, the more it is offset down. But just outside the crater, it is offset upwards to simulate the debris being pushed towards the edge. If the crater offsets down, then we do not apply the surface blocks. From this, we have a flat world with craters. And now we can apply the simplex noise to generate hills. We make sure that the noise has multiple octaves and is not to be too smooth and uses the minimum of two layers of noise to create interesting looking ridges within the hills. And just like that we have the moon, a world type that won't undergo drastic changes such as biomes while still being more interesting than flat world preset they might expect in pre-alpha. Having done this, the game still lacks options which can be considered unplayable to many, so we have to work on the UI now. Proper fonts rendering can be tricky, and honestly I really didn't want to work on the UI, but this feature couldn't wait any longer. So I decided to get a really quick and dirty user interface working, with my own font that I drew from scratch containing only the ASCII character set. I tried stylizing it, but it didn't turn out too well. So over time I modified it to only focus on readability. The font renderer took the texture region of each character and reduced the bounds to exclude transparent pixels, so that the font wasn't monospaced. In the end, this is how it turned out. Later on I suspect I'll have to replace it with a much better font system, otherwise multiple language support will be infeasible. But for now, it will do, and it allowed me to show some useful debug information on screen. Now that I had a really basic font rendering system working, it was time to add buttons. The buttons highlight the borders when hovering over them, and highlight the inside when clicking on them, but only fire the click event when releasing the mouse while being hovered over the clicked element. An invert mouse option and render distance option were added. A render distance option is much better off with a slider instead of a button that cycles between values, but again, I only wanted a quick and dirty system for now. Lastly, I added keybinds. Clicking on a keybind button captures the input of the game, so clicking on any key sets the key code. The menus need much more work, and a polished menu makes a good impression for a game. Getting a pre-alpha out will help me know what to prioritize on usability, as well as the actual features of a game. But that's not all I worked on since last time. Since I knew more blocks were going to be added and I didn't want to manually create slab variants for each, I decided the best way to handle it would be to generate them automatically. I added a boolean flag, generate slabs, that when set to true for a block state, copies the state for bottom slabs, top slabs, and all four vertical slabs, and sets the model to a dummy JSON file that just copies over the texture metadata. This is a really cool data-driven feature that allows me to add slabs with just a single line of configuration, speeding development time drastically while adding features with little effort. I wouldn't have even considered making slabs for logs without it, for example. In the future, this system can be expanded for stairs and abstracted away further, so that any model variants can be generated easily, without changing any code at all. Now let's take a look at the comments. You suggested using the hue shifting technique. Hue shifting is something I know about and I've used before, but it's not ingrained in me as second nature. Which is why I've said before that I don't consider myself a pixel artist. The sand texture should look much better now, thanks to your advice. Many of you ask how I got the image to tile. This is GIMP's tiling symmetry mode, which can be enabled by going to Windows, Dockable Dialogues, Symmetry Painting, then set the symmetry mode to tiling at an internal resolution of 16 by 16. When it came to the player's movement, I originally set the max step height to 0 0.5 specifically for walking on slightly shorter blocks up a slab, so now it is at a value of 0.6. When it comes to connected textures, the algorithm should be similar to greedy meshing, which I had earlier in development but was removed around when custom block models were implemented. After the pre-alpha release, I plan on doing another optimization step. Then I'll investigate re-implementing greedy meshing as well as connected textures. Hopefully it won't be too difficult. Am I planning to add the rest of the solar system? 
When it comes to individual planets, I feel it's important that each one has its own distinct purpose or niche. Otherwise, they'll just seem like redundant palette swaps. I only plan to add planets that will contribute to the theme and plot, to which at the moment only consists of the Earth, the Moon, and something secret. If I add more beyond that, it'll probably be randomly generated planets, akin to Starbound or Spore. One question I frequently get asked is whether I'll add a redstone-like system or not. I absolutely have plans for it, and it'll be one of the three options you'll be able to choose for me to work on next, after the pre-alpha release. So keep an eye out for a poll soon after the release. When it comes to suggesting names for the game, I got a lot of suggestions. Many of them quite good too. It was quite the challenge to find one that matched the theme, sounded good, and wasn't already taken. I won't reveal what I've chose just yet, so you'll have to wait till the next episode. Next time will be the finale of the Remaking Minecraft series, and we'll tackle saving, loading, and deploying of the game. Finally releasing the pre-alpha for you to play. So stay tuned. Take care. And I'll see you next time.